We turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. We were considering last week concerning the living hope referred to in this verse, to which we are born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Christian faith is primarily founded on two great historical facts, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified on Calvary's cross for the sins of the world and rose up from the dead on the third day. On that foundation is built all the rest of the teaching of the New Testament. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ figures prominently in all the teaching of the apostles. In fact, they call themselves the witnesses of his resurrection. There is so much involved in the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It is this that distinguishes him from all other religious leaders. It is this that gives Christianity a unique place. The fact that Jesus conquered death. He is risen from the dead. He has conquered man's greatest enemy, death. Further, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is the proof of the fact that God the Father has accepted his sacrifice on Calvary. And that is what gives us a living hope. Jesus has made a new and living way into the Father's presence through having overcome sin in every temptation that he faced during his earthly life and finally through his death on the cross. And thus through the resurrection we have this living hope that we too can follow in his footsteps, be partakers of his suffering, enter into his death, not the death that he suffered on Calvary as an atoning sacrifice, but death to the flesh and to sin, and thus be a partaker in the resurrection in the coming day. This is the living hope that we have, that death is not going to end everything for us. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, we too can rise from the dead if we follow in his footsteps. And thus we are told in verse 4, 1 Peter 1, 4, that we can obtain an inheritance. And that inheritance is not a piece of property, it's not money, it's not anything material. We are told here that we can obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and that will never fade away. An inheritance, a perfect one, which can never be altered by time, which can never decay or be defiled in any way, and which is reserved in heaven for us. This is the priceless gift of eternal life. Eternal life does not mean merely a life that never ends, but rather a life that had no beginning and has no end. That alone is eternal, which had no beginning and has no end. And that is a life which only God possesses. This is the inheritance that he wants to give to us. We begin to partake of it here on this earth, but we can never have the degree of it that can be ours only when we shed this body of sin. And so we are told that we have an inheritance, not a piece of property in heaven, not a building over which our name is written, as many people think, whose mind is set on material things, but the greatest thing that God can ever give us. Have you ever considered, dear friends, what is the greatest thing that God can give you? Is it a building in heaven? That would be worthless. Is it some gold or silver or maybe some position of authority in heaven? Is that the greatest thing God can give us? Or is it a crown of gold upon our head? None of these things. The greatest thing that God can ever give to any human being is his own life, his own nature. There's absolutely nothing superior to that. That is the inheritance which is imperishable. God's life cannot be corrupted. It cannot be defiled. Everything else 
will get corrupted and defiled with the passage of time. But God's reserved for us an inheritance that's incorruptible. In 1 John 3, 2, we read, We shall be like Him when we see Him. And this is what is reserved in heaven for us. Blessed are those who are looking for this when Jesus comes. Those who are going to look for a house to live in in heaven may be disappointed. Those who are looking for a crown of gold to wear on their heads for eternity will be terribly disappointed. But those who are looking for a richer and fuller participation in the life of God and in partaking of the divine nature will not be disappointed because God's reserved it for them. And it says here in verse 5 that we are protected by the power of God or kept by God's power through our faith. In other words, God's power operates through our faith for a full salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation has got three tenses about it. Past, present and future. There is a salvation from the penalty of sin which we receive when our sins are forgiven. We are cleansed in the blood of Christ and believe in Him who took the judgment of God for our sin on Calvary's hill. There is a salvation in the present tense which is a salvation from the power of sin which takes place in us right now, day by day progressively. We are freed increasingly from that sin that dwells in our flesh. But then there is also a salvation in the future tense which is a salvation from the very presence of sin. That can never take place on this earth in our present body. It can only take place when Jesus comes and we are given a new body where we are removed, sanctified, set apart completely from the very presence of sin itself. This is the salvation spoken of in verse 5, which is going to be revealed now in a few more days when Jesus comes back in glory. And until that time, we are told in verse 5, we are kept, praise God for that, that we are kept by the power of God. We could not keep ourselves, you know. We would fall into sin continuously. But by God's power, we can be kept from falling. Just like Peter could walk on top of the water when Jesus commanded him to walk. Because the power of God was greater than the power of gravity that sought to pull Peter down. And so it is today. The power of God's grace is greater than the power of sin. And when we experience that grace of God as a power that frees us from the dominion of sin, Romans 6.14, then we experience what's spoken of in this verse. Protected or kept by the mighty power of God unto salvation. God keeps us. Jesus keeps us from falling. We are guarded from sin, protected from the defiling influences of the flesh and its lusts and from the influences of the world. Praise God that the power of God can be a wall of fire around us if we will submit to it so that we need never be defiled by sin, never be corrupted by the influences of the world. But it says further here in the fifth verse that this power of God can operate in our lives only through our faith. This is another important principle that we discover in the New Testament. In Ephesians and chapter 1, we are told that the prayer of the Apostle Paul is that our eyes may be opened to see what is the exceeding greatness of his power available to all those who believe, Ephesians 1.19. That power can be appropriated only by faith. God extends his hand offering us his power, but we cannot receive it until we extend our hand, which is the hand of faith, and take that power from God's hand. How much power can we receive from God? According to our faith, it will be unto us. That is the measure in which we receive God's power. But if we have faith, we can receive God's power 
to keep us from sin, to protect us from the defilements of the world, ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. 